especially those who showed up here and stood outside in the freezing cold um, before we could get into the uh, building. Um, I'm really uh, impressed and uh, very happy that all of you were able to join us today. Um, I hope you find this conference to be um, illuminating and interesting and worth your while. So, uh, what I'm going to talk, my name is James O'Keefe. I am the captain, for lack of a better term, of the Massachusetts Pirate Party, uh, <clears throat> which is, you know, basically chief bottle washer and volunteer and stuff like that. So, a um, bit about, a bit of background about myself. Um, I was in the Greens for about 10 years. Um, their co-chair, their treasurer, uh, worked on the Nader campaign, uh, was their 2002 and 2006 candidate for treasurer of the Commonwealth. Uh, got 160,000 votes the first time, 320 the second time. A um, lot of fun and enjoyed it. Um, <clears throat> but uh, in terms of where I want the party to go is learning from what we did in the Greens um, and focusing more on the <clears throat> lower level offices, getting people elected there, state rep, school committee member, all those, and building our way up rather than going for like governor and president, things like that. So my talk here, and I have 45 minutes, so if I go too fast, tell me, um, is campaign to win, campaign for fun. Um, I was chided on the Ars Technica um, discussion about this event, uh, about the name. So I like this one better, and I appreciate the feedback that I got. So what am I going to cover here? First, what's your goal in running? Once you know your goal, you know well, what office should you choose. You can work on then preparing yourself, getting started, the campaign, and then find the useful folks. If someone could get me some water, that would be fantastic. I got it. Thanks. So what's your goal? Um, I'm a person who believes that in our winner-take-all uh, electoral system, where you know if you don't get 5%, in Germany, say, for example, if you get 5% of the vote, you're in. Your list it, at the state level, at the federal level, at the municipal level, has representation. Uh, here, we have district-based, very 18th century way of doing things. It uh, doesn't really work for our 21st century uh, life. But nevertheless, we're still stuck with it. And uh, so my viewpoint in focusing on building a small party is is making sure that, yes, you want to run, and yes, you want to run to win, but at the same time, realize that the deck is stacked against you, and there are multiple ways of succeeding uh, beyond just winning. So, again, your goal to win. If I, am I in the? You're good. Perfect. Um, so <clears throat> there are a bunch of goals. There's to win, to identify supporters and volunteers for future efforts, be they electoral or other campaigns, um, issue campaigns or, or ballot measures, things like that. To educate voters about the issues that matter to you. And um, ideally, you want to do all three. So what are you facing? So as I, as I alluded to, you know, over half the candidates in contested elections lose. That's just the fact. You've got three candidates for one office. Only one's going to get in. Two of them are going to lose. Uh, with our big money in politics, the better connected and financed candidate often wins. Um, and while it may not be the case that it's 100%, I will point out that, especially in Massachusetts, we have a lot of candidates who have big war chests, and people don't even bother to run against them. Because why put in the effort to run if you know you're going to lose anyways because they have a huge amount of money. So that corrupts our system and leads to districts where we only have one candidate running. Uh, <clears throat> you know, as a result, as I said, many offices, many offices only have one person running for them. So what should you choose? Uh, 
there's town and city, state house, state senate, county, U.S. House of Representatives, governor's councils, U.S. Senate, president, and Massachusetts constitutional offices, such as governor, lieutenant governor, things like that. So town elections. The town elections in Massachusetts are held, there are 351 cities and towns. There's about 30 cities. So there's almost 320, um, almost 320 um, towns. So town elections, again, the first half of every year, usually there's select board, town moderator, treasurer, school committee. And for a small number of towns, there's elected town meeting. Usually most towns are small enough, they have open town meeting. Towns like Framingham have an elect, or Arlington or Amherst have elected town meeting. And those are probably the easiest offices to get into. City elections, mayor, city council, school committee, those are the ones that are usually up. And those are held the November of even of um, what are they November of odd years. Well, okay, I'll fix that. That's good. All right, State House and Senate, Massachusetts General Court, 160 House members, 40 uh, Senate members. Elections are held in the November of even years. And of course, both, um, both uh, the House and the Senate are overwhelmingly <coughs> Democratic. So to get on the ballot for State House and Senate, it's only 150 valid voters to get on the ballot for House. Now, proportional to the number of voters, that's fairly high with other states. But as an aggregate number, you know, pers one person could gather 150 signatures in two months. Um, papers are available in February of 2012, and they're due basically April of 2012. The end of, yes, the end of April <clears throat> or thereabouts uh, to cities and towns. County elections. County commissioner, district attorney, register of probate needs. <coughs> I mean, personally, I'd love to get a pirate in as a sheriff. I mean, that would be a <laughs> tremendous accomplishment <laughs> on a wide variety of things. <coughs> in terms of, I mean, a lot of, uh, like, register of deeds, uh, a lot of those things are, have already been automated. I'm sure there's more uh, openness we could and transparency we could bring to those. U.S. House elections. So, <clears throat> the U.S. House is the yeah. highest office that the Massachusetts Pirate Party will try and run candidates for. Um, there are ten of them. There are going to be nine in 2012. Uh, all of them are held by Democrats. Um, getting on the ballot requires 2,000 valid voters to sign your nomination papers. The rule of thumb with those is if you, whatever the number of signatures you need, prepare to get double that in terms of raw signatures. Papers are due February 12th, um, but for us, uh, sorry, papers are available February 12th, but February 2012, sorry, but <clears throat> they're not due back until August, which gives more time. So other offices, my basic, my basic viewpoint is good luck. Uh, having been there, uh, it's a wonderful endeavor, and certainly if you run for the low, like treasurer, auditor, where you know we have a high percentage of people who don't even vote for those offices, you're 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 easily going to get three percent. Um, but <clears throat> in terms of building the, a party, I think focusing on the lower level offices is the better choice. So preparing yourself, be honest with yourself. Uh, I know in my first run, I came really close to having an incredibly upset wife. Um, and I do not recommend people go through that type of thing. But, but when you prepare yourself, you have to be sure, is this really what you want to do? Do you want to spend from March all the way to November, potentially, if you're running for, say, state house, um, campaigning? Now, obviously, dependent upon if, if you're running to win, then you're, that's pretty much your job. Uh, if you're running for identifying voters and other goals, you can get away with putting less effort into it. Um, but if you're ready, if this is what you want to do, let's get started. So first, be honest with yourself. Do you really want the job? You know, you don't want to like run for <coughs> um, house. Of, you don't want to run for like select board. 
and then and get the job and like oh, you know I, I really didn't want to be there. Um, so you know know what the job entails. Uh, are you prepared prepared for the pressures of campaigning? Does your partner support your run? Uh, are you prepared for what it's going to take in terms of your time? Uh, and are you known in your community? That's probably one of the best. You know, if, if you're not known in your community, it it um, it does uh, All right. So if you're not ready, um, that's okay. You can do other things. You can choose a less demanding office, start an issue campaign. Uh, start a party chapter, volunteer for a local board or commission, school, <coughs> um, your lo local, uh, Massachusetts, every, um, every, uh, every school has a school site council, get on that, um, join a community activist group, there's lots of things to do, but if you're ready, let's lay the groundwork. Okay, so if you know you want to run let's say 2013, um, for town, go to the town, go to the select board meetings. Um, get involved in local organizations. Not to go and say, hey, I'm a pirate, why don't you join me, but hey, I'm a pirate, and how can I help you? Volunteer at local boards, support other candidates, write letters to the other. Get known. Identify people who may help you. Um, getting started, so find people to help, Role, so this is the overview. The roles in the filling, know your district. Let's go through. So find people to help. For most offices, you cannot run alone. The one is probably elected town meeting. I've heard of people who do that. Um, and generally, most people don't even campaign for elected town meeting. Um, so identify people in the party, uh, friends, family, uh, folks who folks who you know in the community, things like. So, obviously these roles that need filling, if you're running for select board, you may not need them. The more people that you have taking on these tasks, the better off you're gonna be. So, obviously if you're going to be running, if you're going to be spending any money, um, you need a treasurer, uh, you'll need a chair, uh, your spouse can be your treasurer. <laughs> Um, you need a campaign manager, volunteer coordinator, field operations. So these, these are basically, think of these as tasks um, or roles that need filled. But if the office is small enough, then you can go and fill most of those yourself. But obviously if you have other people doing it, um, and sort of the bigger the office, you really want other people helping you and being responsible for those. So again, I pretty much just... You have to have a treasurer, um, I've pretty much said all that I've said, uh, but delegate, delegate is important. Know your district, know who and where are your voters. So you can get voter lists from your city or town. That has things like address, date of birth, gender, party info, stuff like that. You can get demographics data from the US 2010 census. Uh, you can, there's usually data that you can get of who owns what properties. And if you're so inclined and have someone who can cross-reference the voter data with um, the owner data, you can figure out who are owners and who are renters, and thus you can tailor your message better. That in some ways is an important thing, being able to know, okay, I'm gonna go to this, I'm going to know I'm going to send someone mailing or I'm going to knock on their door knowing ahead of time, okay, this person's a renter, um, will help dramatically in terms of what issues you focus on them. And then, of course, what issues are a local concern? Are there issues about uh, finances? Are there issues about the school, police? You should know them. Any questions so far? Yes, sir. What's the best way to get phone numbers for everybody in your district? Um, you can go on the web. There are various services that will charge you a fee for every name. And what they'll do is they'll look up the phone numbers. Although in this day and age when people use their cell phones and don't have landlines, um, you may not always get as many hits. Uh, but you can do that. Certainly for the smaller list, it's easy enough, and that's useful information to have. 
Um, another, this the state lists, I mean the voter lists are pretty up to date. They do a yearly census. Um, and they mark people as active or inactive. If people haven't voted in say like two to four years, they'll mark someone inactive. Um, and you can go to the same services where you can look up phone numbers and find out, um, they'll, they'll look at the person's name and the address and they'll go into the, voter, go into the USPS, US Postal Services database and they'll check to see if they've moved or not. And that's sometimes useful information to have as well. So constituencies, identify the people who are going to support you. Um, is your demographic, you know, do you look at it and say, okay, I'm going to go after parents? Uh, am I going to go after seniors? Am I going to go after those under 30? Understand what their concerns are. Get the district data so that you can see who they are individually. As I said, date of birth is easy, gender, where they live. Um, but if, if you have a limited amount of time and a limited amount of money, the more, the more that you can know about your voters, the better off you are. And a lot of it is just crunching numbers, and if you can get someone who's good with spreadsheets or databases to crunch those numbers for you, you'll be better off. So find your issues. Identify the key issues to focus on. Um, two or three max for local campaigns, more for state campaigns. Um, but still, you want to keep it small, right? I mean, usually the idea in some ways in doing this is, well, you need issues that are going to resonate with people, but you also need to be able to, when someone has a question um, and you answer it, you want to be able to some, take that question and turn it around into one of your issues. So if someone says, I'm concerned about um, <clears throat> If, if someone says, I'm concerned about um, pol the police presence and not having enough police, and your issue is taxation, well, then if there's some way of taking that and saying, well, you know, if we raise taxes or we broaden our tax base, for example, uh, we could have more police officers if that was their concern. That's something to keep in mind and being able to steer it back to that. So you develop a core message. Once you know um, your key issues, <clears throat> then you can basically get your spiel together. It should be short and simple, but you tie in with your key issues. All right, so test your issues. Make sure that uh, you're running it past friends, friendly audience, and see what they think. Um, all this is, this is going to be, well, this is, the older version of this is posted on our website. Um, and uh, who knows, maybe I'll turn it into a video on YouTube. <coughs> uh, so, and um, over time, you'll refine your message. As the more you have to practice it, you'll get better and better at saying it. Um, so logistics. Um, <clears throat> I can't stress how much logistics is important in a campaign. Um, Knowing when you have events coming up, that you have volunteers to stand out with signs um, is important. Knowing you have volunteers who are going to be there to go door to door is important. Um, so having a good sense of your logistics, both volunteers and budget and fundraising is key. One tactic that I've learned is not to go and say, I've got this budget, I want to raise $6,000. But to go and say, okay, the first five hundred, the first hundred dollars, I'm going to spend here, and the first five hundred dollars, I'm going to spend here, and then the next five hundred dollars, here's where I'm going to spend it. So you have a plan that as money comes in, you know where it's going. Not, I've got this six thousand dollar budget. How am I ever going to fundraise? Break it into small pieces. It's like anything, you break the project into small pieces, and it becomes manageable. Um, Knowing a graphic designer who can design flyers and signs is a good thing, um, and it helps it dramatically. Uh, and then the media will certainly, less so as for the lower offices, but I know with my run, it was useful to have a friend who was a professional photographer take pictures of me um, to have when the media came and said, okay, we want to run an article on you, where's a picture? And I'm not going through 
all of my iPhoto, like, okay, is that a good picture? Is that a good picture? Um, you know, and you also need those for any literature that you have. Certainly, if, if you've got your family, having a picture of you with your family will help. Um, the campaign. So, any questions? Are your eyes blazing over? Mm -hmm. I do. <laughs> I'm doing this. All right, campaign. Initial activities. So, initial activities, volunteers, this is basically the list we're just going to go through. All right, so, open social media accounts, they're free. Um, <clears throat> and try and be on them. You know, try and, there are different tactics. I'm sure there's other stuff out there you can do. Um, just going and following a bunch of people, uh, say on Twitter, or just following people that you know in the area, um, people who are going to be interested in your campaign. So you need to identify initial contributors. So you make a list of all of your um, friends, family members who you can hit up for money. Um, you obtain and file a committee to elect papers. Um, and <clears throat> things like, so you can start raising money, who's going to be your treasurer, uh, and file those either with your city or town or with the state, depending on the office. Get checks from your contributors, open your bank account, make your first deposit, open your website. Volunteers. Um, it's really important to have someone organizing volunteers. If that's the camp, if you have a campaign manager and that's what they're doing, great. But if you're big enough, it's useful to have a volunteer organizer in addition to a campaign manager. Um, you know, if you're going to have them do a mass mailing, if you're going to have them go door to door, say thank you, give them lunch, give them dinner. Factor that into your budget, um, and of course. If someone goes and does something good for you, they give a contribution or they volunteer, um, have note cards that you can just write up, thanks so much for your help, stick a label on it or write their address and mail it off to them. Just those little things help and they reinforce um, the connection between volunteers and the candidate and volunteers in the campaign. So these Ideas are not simply electoral. You can't apply them to other types of campaigns. They're just tactics and strategies that can be useful. So fundraising, as I said, you make a list of potential contributors, friends, family, coworkers, neighbors, things like that. Um, you write a phone fundraising script. If you're small enough, maybe you go door to door. Um, you can send them letters. Certainly calls are useful. You call through your list or you contact them. Um, ideally, as I said, you call or you talk with them in person, then you send them a reminder letter with a return envelope, and of course, when they contribute, mail them back um, a thank you. Follow up, ask contributors, of course, whether they would, or, and volunteers, whether they'll endorse you in writing, whether, certainly for contributors, whether they'll volunteer, whether they'll hold a house party. Does anyone, <coughs> anyone know, not know what a house party is? Party sure. at your house? Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but basically where, where people will come over um, and hear where the, someone will host a party and they'll have food and things like that and the candidate comes and speaks about the campaign. Um, and of course, follow, be sure to follow up on all offers of assistance. Either ideally, if it's big enough, if it's just you, then it's just you, but if it's the candidate or, um, or if it's a campaign manager or your volunteer director, make sure someone, if someone says, yeah, I'd like to help, make sure the next day someone is asking them to help. Uh, of course, send thank you letters from you. So get on the ballot. Um, make, this is really vital. Um, I, I, it's, uh, you know, I know you know. Um, there was a state rep who I, actually I think there's been a couple of state reps, um, who did things like, well, they gathered the signatures and then they left them on their desk and never actually dropped them off. One, one, one guy, unfortunately, had it stolen from his, off, from his office in the state house. Um, I like that state rep, but 
we all make mistakes. But it, it's important, if you don't get on the ballot, then doing a writing campaign, which is possible here, is difficult. So get on the ballot, so know what the requirements are, know how many signatures you need to get, know what the dates are, know the rules for the nomination papers. So for example, don't make any stray marks on it, because if you make a stray mark on it, that could invalidate the entire petition. So if someone goes and like writes a line through your whole petition, just put that one aside <laughs> and start a new one. Um, so you pick up, because that, if it gets challenged, that can be thrown out. And you don't want any of your signatures thrown out. Um, so you pick up the nomination papers, you gather your signatures, you file the nomination papers. It's a two-stage process. You file it with cities and towns. They check, yes, this person's a voter, no, this person isn't, and then you file it with whatever. So if it's a state, you file it with the Secretary of State. If it's municipality, you file, file it with the municipality. Um, of course, again, mail thank you letters. Becoming a broken record. How's the audio on this? Am I enunciating well? You're doing fine. Perfect. Uh -huh. Yeah, but I have a question. Yes, sir. Um, so I remember we did the Pirate Party, you know, to get as a political designation. Correct. And it was a statewide thing. And we had to uh, validate the signatures with the cities and towns first. So all the signatures were validated when we sent them on. Correct. To the Secretary of State. How is that different or is it the same when you're running for offices if it's not a local office within the town? So that's a special case because we only, um, so normally nomination papers, say for state rep, are by town or city. So you have Boston, and then all the people who sign are from Boston. You take that sheet and you give it to Boston. The election division, they look everyone up for you. But since the number of signatures is small, um, and everything is on one sheet, you basically have to contact them and say, is this person a voter? Yes, send me a proof that they are. So I think it's just that way you don't have to go, it isn't by city or town, you can just get 50 random people and do it. Okay. But nor normally you, you drop it off at your municipality. They validate them. Yes, this is a person. This is a voter. Friedrich Nietzsche. No, that's not a voter. Um, and then you hand them back. They hand it back to you, and then you go and drop them off. Um, okay. So getting signatures. Get the most in the least amount of time. When you're getting signatures, um, besides fundraising and identifying volunteers, that's the most important thing. Uh, I do know of one person who gathered something like 9,000 valid signatures, so you figure it's way more, 15,000, um, just to get himself on the ballot for U.S. Senate. I don't recommend that. Um, I, better to have people helping you, but he was able to do that. Um, so, know what voters you need. So if it's municipality, city, town, any voter will do it. If it's an uh, office that's by party where there's a primary, um, then if you're a Democrat, Republican, or at this stage, Green Rainbow, then only people who are in your party or who are unenrolled can sign your nomination papers. So a Democrat can't sign for a Republican, but someone who's unenrolled can. Um, and then for us, as pirates, and the we have a political designation, we can take any voter. We are sort of super unenrolled. <laughs> Although you don't get to vote in the primaries, so. <clears throat> but are there really competitions there? Um, so that's, you know, know, know who you need to get signatures for. All right, ask voters to sign and print their name so the name can be read clearly. You know, writing the address and then shh, and you're like, who is that? I, you know, have them print it next to it. Um, Never leave the nomination papers unattended. Don't say, oh, I'm going to leave this on the community board someplace. Yeah, it'll go away. <laughs> Just not a good idea. Never put stray marks on it. Uh, if someone puts a stray mark on it, put it aside, get a new one. Um, find places where your voters are likely to be, your neighborhood, busy town square. I, we had good luck in 2002 with dumps and recycling centers. 
Um, <laughs> well, especially in places like Norton, where there's a huge number of people who are unenrolled. Here, it's, there's so many Democrats. It's not an issue for, for us when we were Greens, when I was a Green and running. Um, that was an issue. So we had so many Democrats in, say, Cambridge that we exhausted our pool fairly easily. But you went out to some towns where 80% of the people are unenrolled, it becomes a lot easier. Um, festivals and places where people aren't in a rush. Of course, always be polite, but don't get into chats. Your objective is to get signatures. Yes? I found supermarkets and shopping centers are great places. The only problem is if there's if it's just the shopping center, yes, but if it's just a supermarket, they can say you're on private land, you can't get off. If there's two or more businesses in that area, then that's public property. But if there's only one, so if you're like at Walmart and there's just Walmart, they can say, no, you cannot gather signatures here. But if you're at some open air mall, then that's a different story. They can't get you off. So materials. Um, <clears throat> Try and speed it up. All right. Um, so you need to develop materials, flyers, mailers, yard signs, having a common logo or stylistic uh, flourish to your name, or just the way it is, so that it's on all your. If you have letterhead, if you have mailers, if you have flyers, into that. Um, one thing I really liked were a third of the page flyers because they're fairly cheap. They give all the you, do, you give all the information, and they're easy to hand out. I mean. Remember walking up and down the red line, <laughs> hanging them out on trains um, in 2002. So they're really easy to do. Um, it doesn't cost you a lot of money. Uh, if you're do working, you know, state rep, municipal elections, you can do mailable flyers. They're like little circulars. I've seen those done. Um, of course, the internet is vitally important. Uh, you know, setting up a blog where you're saying, well, we're going to have this event, or I'm going to be here. Um, again, Twitter, Facebook, fan pages, things like that. Um, anything to make it easy for people to interact with you. Um, you know, tie your blog posts to the social networks. And frequent personal posts, you know, even if it's just, you know, once a week is great. If you can do more than that, fine. If it's like a month. It doesn't seem like the campaign is doing much. So you need to be making it uh, frequent enough. Um, and then once you have a set of stuff you've done, you know, go through and certainly, well, either way, but start following people in media on the network. Um, and, you know, retweet other tweets that seem germane. You know, if there's a reporter who goes and is following your beat and they say something, they, they mention you, retweet it. If there's something about your opponent, Resend it. You know, I mean, the more that's bad about your opponent, of course, not good. Um, <laughs> go through it and, you know, send other things. Uh, supportive comments, whatever. Um, one thing I won't talk as much about, though, uh, more because my own experience doesn't have it, but I, there are people who will go through and they're doing things like targeting ads on Facebook or they're targeting ads on um, certainly Google. But Facebook seems to be one where they can, you can kind of hone in on um, a particular people who live in a particular area and you can target ads to them. I leave it to your discretion. It, it's been used successfully, at least in a couple of cases, for insurgent candidates where they didn't. Uh, and if you want, I can dig up the URL sometime and mail it out to folks. But um, where this guy who didn't have much of a name was going against an entrenched incumbent, and he won. And he really had a very focused Facebook campaign um, to get access to people and tell them about what his issues were. Um, one thing to keep in mind in all of this is the rule of thumb is it takes seven interactions with the candidate or with the candidate's materials or things before people, <clears throat> people actually um, know you exist. Uh, and maybe even are interested in what you have to say. So the more impressions, the more interactions, the better. Uh, okay, so again, find creative ways to share your message, um, post pictures of you and volunteers and supporters of the campaign trail, make fun videos, maybe they'll go viral. Um, and it's useful to email folks, but of course don't spam. 
anyone? To find life for that one there? Um, I, media, identify the local media and the reporters, set up meetings, less so for say, less so of an issue for town meeting member, pretty much everyone up, it's, it's vital for. Uh, meet with the media to talk about your issues, make sure you're following the reporters on Twitter or Facebook, um, if you can. Facebook, of course, is usually dual connections. Uh, and then, of course, keep in contact with reporters, invite them to your events and your door-to-door -door outings and things like that so they know what you're doing. Um, publicity, if you have enough, enough support, uh, hold a kickoff event, invite all your supporters, media, make sure it's well attended. You know, you don't want to have an event where five people show up and three of them are reporters. Not good. <clears throat> um, of course, later on in the campaign, you're going to need to have yard signs. You ask your supporters to put up yard signs, holding standouts and visibilities in the last month. Now, meet your voters. You're only going to get votes if people, A, know who you are, and B, like what you have to say. So the more times you can interact with voters, the better off you are. Um, so, so have a supporter who is a parent of a child, for these are just examples. You know, have, if, if you know a friend who's, or a supporter whose child is at a particular school, Go there and pick up or drop off, and usually drop off, uh, or usually pick up and shake hands and meet with folks, have them introduce you. Of course, block parties. If there's a block party, it's in your district, you should be there. Um, and of course, have meet and greet events at senior centers or for members of local groups. Keep track of who you meet and their concerns as much as possible. You know, if you can have someone with you who's like just surreptitiously writing down the name of the person so you can go to the voter and then later on maybe you knock on the door, oh, I spoke with you at X event. Um, always gives a good impression. Uh, of course, follow up with the voters uh, by dropping off a flyer, uh, perhaps with a thank you note, mailing a flyer. Um, and of course, uh, one successful way is to have supporters mail, um, write their own letters to their friends as to why they should support you. <clears throat> the key thing in, and it's not done as much, but the key way of interacting with voters and meeting voters is going door to door. This is something that as soon as you're on the ballot, you really just want to be doing every week. Um, if you hit the same people a couple times, it's not as much of a problem, but you want to be able to, people will identify with a candidate and they'll be willing to support a candidate if they can actually interact, if they've interacted and they've talked with the candidate. Um, you know, if your opponent goes and says nasty things about you, they're more likely to discard that if they've met you and you seem like a really nice person. Yeah, and that <clears throat> it's very much about interacting with voters, meeting them, uh, going to where they are. So um, again, identify them, tell them about you, meet them. You've got the voter list. You can use that for having having your walk list. And you want to, streets are usually even and odd, right? So you want to put all the even names together and all the odd names. It's all the, all the odd streets and all the even streets together. Um, that way you're not, oh, this person is at number two, so I'll walk over here. Oh, let me cross the street to go to number three. Don't waste your time, right? Just two, four, six, go through there, go around the next street, do that. Um, when you interact with the voters, of course, mark them as, how you assess their support. Are they lukewarm? Well, maybe there are three. Um, are they gung-ho? Yes, I will vote for you. Okay, there are five. Are they like, I don't, I, I'm definitely voting for your opponent? Mark them as one. Because you're going to need that to, as part of your get out the vote uh, campaign. So again, if someone isn't supportive, don't engage in chit chat, move on. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> find someone who is. Don't waste your time with someone who isn't going to support you. 
Um, and that's also said, if someone is supportive, it's useful to get into um, good conversations that reinforces things, uh, their support for you, but at the same time, your objective is to meet as many people as you can, um, and to identify as many people who are going to support you as, as you can. So, of course, when someone is at home, leave them a little flyer hanging on the doorknob saying, I was here, sorry I missed you, here's what I stand for. Hope I can see you next time. If you wanna, if you wanna help us, here's the phone number. By the way, Google Voice, you can get a phone number, it's for free. Um, <clears throat> by the way, camp campaign finance rules, anything that's free to everyone is free to your campaign. So Google Voice, any of the, the other Google services, if they're free, uh, if they've got a free plan and you're using the free plan, you don't have to record, you know, you don't have to record zero dollars given to Google, you know, so. Um, and that's certainly useful in cash draft campaigns. So again, more, so, we've identified our voters. The election is coming up. Now our objective is we know which voters um, are going to support us, which ones are lukewarm, which ones don't want to support us. Ideally, we need to make sure that the ones who are going to support us and the ones who are hopefully going to support us get to the polls. Okay? If you have, if you need a thousand people to win and you've identified 2,000 supporters there, but you can only turn out 500, you lose. Right? You really need to make sure you get people there. So, <clears throat> um, You've gone through your door-to-door. -door. So before the vote, before the election, call supporters, remind them that you need their vote. Tell them where the polling place is, when it is open. Ask them if they need a ride to the polls. As close as the election, as close to the election as you can, drop off notices to all supporters, telling them where they can vote, when their polling place is open, do they need a ride, things like that. On election day you are allowed to have one person in every polling place. And I don't know, you usually go in when you go and vote, and they say, address, and you give your address, and they check, and they check their voter rolls. You can have someone with their own analogous list. Check, okay, this person voted. So you have your list of people who are gonna vote for you, check, okay. Now the advantage to that is you can then have someone come by, hand them the list, they can hand back a new list, and then you know who's voted. And you can go to your database of, here's my database of supporters, and I can see, okay, who do we need to do the last minute call in the last three hours or so to make sure they get to the poll? Yes, sir? You know, a lot of towns have uh, one polling place, but they might have five or six precincts. Can you have a uh, poll watcher for each precinct? My guess is you can have a poll watcher for each person who's gathering, um, who, who's there doing the, valid, the voter validation. Um, okay, of course, you also want to have volunteers holding signs outside of polling places if you can. Yeah, can I uh, but, yeah. ask? A year or so ago, I read that actually, you know, you can't go into the polling place like saying you're a a member of the Green Party That's or correct. Democrat, but uh, that uh, there was no ban against <coughs> dressing as a pirate. <laughs> I don't know if that's still true. I'm going to have to suggest to JB that uh, that's what he should do. <laughs> yes. Back in 2008, I wore an Obama mask to the polls, and they made me take it off. So. <laughs> No masks. <laughs> Although an eye patch, I think, would be okay. Eye patch, yeah. <laughs> Could you wear a Nixon mask? <laughs> um, okay, so, you know, if your choice is between having someone who's in there keeping track of who's voted and having someone who's standing outside holding a sign, it's probably better to have the person inside. If you have more, then of course have people outside. So, of course, you need to have volunteers who are going to go out to your different polling places and give coffee, hot chocolate, snacks to volunteers um, to pick up supporter checklists and to drive supporters to the polls. 
Um, I remember in 1998, there was, I was holding a sign in a freezing November night uh, outside of a polling place nearby um, for the clean elections law. And I chatted with some other folks who were there holding signs for Michael Capuano, um, who is a uh, current congressman of my district and had been mayor at the time. And, you know, we had a nice chat. And then a van pulled up. And this guy said, do you want coffee? Do you want hot chocolate? And they asked those two people, they asked the, the two supporters. And, you know, they said, yeah, I'd, I'd like coffee, I'd like hot chocolate. And they, he turned to me. I wasn't even in the campaign. Do you want some hot chocolate? Do you want something? Sure! <laughs> you know, you win points for that. <laughs> um, and it certainly made an impression on me, but then he had a well-oiled machine. All right, so when the polls are closed, we're, we're winding things down. You know, you need to have your poll watchers get the preliminary vote count, because if you can know that um, ahead of time, you can know whether you won or not. Um, of course, you, you should hold an election night party to thank volunteers, and hopefully all of your, um, all of your polling place watchers, you'll gather all the numbers and say, we won or we didn't win. The days after, of course, update your website, social media accounts with thank yous and election results. Uh, if you've got signs, put thank you stickers up. Um, mail your remaining thank you cards. Be sure in like the week after to pick up all your signs, all your literature, things like that. Um, <clears throat> write thank you, write thank you, um, write a thank the voters letter um, that you can publish in the local paper. Uh, and of course, fundraise to clear away any campaign debt. That's it. There's a bunch of useful books. Um, I found them to be. I found them to be useful, and I highly recommend them. Um, I'm done. Are there any questions? First, I want to encourage you. It's, it, it is a really time-consuming but very fun activity to run for office. And you'll go and you'll meet lots of people. Um, so I highly recommend it. I've gone with the standpoint of if you want to run a winning campaign, this is what you need to do. But if you have a long-term plan and you say, okay, well, I want to run for state rep, but I know there's an incumbent this year, but maybe he may retire in two years, so I want to make a name for myself, so I'm just going to run this year, do it. Even if you lose, um, you'll still get attention. And that would be useful for your issues um, <clears throat> and the, the causes you're, you're uh, fighting for. That's all I have to say. Any questions? Sir? I was um, involved in an initiative petition, and we were able to get permission to get this CD or DVD or whatever it was from the state house. But boy, were they fussy about, you know, you might even have to return it. You can't let it leak out, and you have to sign all kinds of things and be responsible for it. But it was a master list of all the people in the state. But you have to have someone who knows how to manipulate all the some sort of database software for that. Is there some good, well-known software that we never found? Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's in a pipe uh, really limited format. Um, there, I mean, I know of a guy who that's his business, and that he will go, if you give him the data, he has software that you can basically you that you can rent or purchase. And it'll do, it does, he brings in lots of data, identifies names, and says, okay, this person is probably Latino, or this person is, <clears throat> you know, it'll go through all of, all of that data, and he'll pull in other data, phone numbers, and things like that. Um, and he can do it for a small campaign. So that's certainly, you know, if, if folks are interested, I can put you in touch with him. Um, if you know someone who's familiar with the database, there's a lot you can do. Even with a spreadsheet, there's a lot you can do. It's just you have to import it. It's a weird format. It's what they're called, what are called comma or tab delimited formats, where each field is is separated by a comma or a tab. They use a pipe character, which is kind of that vertical line. Um, I don't know why they do that, but um, that's what they do. But if you just Usually, like Excel, if you bring it into Excel or something, you can load it in, and then you can transform the addresses and things for the spreadsheet. 
And if it's, I wouldn't want to do it with four million voter records. Um, it, as there are four million registered voters, but if you have just you know a couple thousand or even twenty thousand, you can do that in a spreadsheet. Does that help? We've we seen some rather high prices for some professional support. That was Agreed, and, but I think there's a lot you can still do with a spreadsheet, depending upon the, how big your data is. And yeah. if you want afterwards, I'm happy to talk with you about that or stuff. Questions? Yes, sir. I have a comment and a question. So on the database thing, if you have a supporter who's a really good database develop developer, it will make a huge difference. But the, so the question though I had though, most of what you said in your talk is great stuff, but if I was like in the member of a different party, it would be just as useful to me. Absolutely. Now as a pirate, um, the pirate party historically has had a constrained set of issues. And you talked about having one or two issues, three issues that connect with voters. How do you feel about um, staying inside the confines of that or kind of being creative, painting outside the lines of it a little? How do you feel about expanding the issues of the Pirate Party in relation to running a campaign and connecting with voters about, because like in Sweden, they had a lot of trouble connecting with voters in a recent election because copyright, which is what they were known for, was not a hot topic at that time. Um. I think, especially with our municipal focus, where copyright isn't really an issue, we need to broaden things. Um, I think focusing on schools and making sure that schools are open, say for example, using open textbooks, um, making schools as kind of hubs of Wi-Fi access and maybe municipal nets. So if you, you, look, at, you look at a part of, a, of your city and it's like, okay, that part is ill-served with internet access? Well, what would it take to go and provide Wi-Fi access uh, in, in that school that covers some of the neighborhood? Like, what would that cost? Um, and then being able to, uh, kind of those openness, openness applies at all levels. And in Massachusetts especially, openness is an important issue. So that one we've got covered. But at certainly municipal level, I think schools, education are vitally important. Um, making sure education, we've got a lot of teaching to the test now, but making sure um, we're doing innovative ways of helping students to learn. Um, not just going with, I mean, both my parents are retired Boston public school teachers, so you know I completely support teachers. Um, but at the same time, we need to think, to, to use a cliche, out of the box. <laughs> and, and we need to come up with ways that are going to challenge students um, and not just teach to the test. I, I think personally we need to push back on that. Um, I don't have all of them, but opening a dialogue. Um, and it may be as a candidate, you go and say, okay, these are, you know, I'm going to make sure we're going to open up government, I'm going to make sure schools are maybe in internet access, and I'm going to make sure schools are uh, more inclusive of different learning styles and things like that. But I don't know completely how to get there, so I'm going to ask my 